from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our audience worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start today with the markets once again, with equities trying to put together back-to-back -back gains. Taylor Riggs is here for a report. So typically we don't see back-to-back -back gains. We haven't seen yeah. a big gain since uh, February 11th, 12th, which was the last time when you had a big rally. It followed through with a second day of rally. Of course, all of the hopes coming on the stimulus this morning. I do want to talk a little bit about the 10 years. because you're seeing sort of a classic risk on move uh, uh, with the um, uh, if the equities are rising, get right. it together, Taylor. <laughs> Bond yields it. are still falling. So now down below 80 basis points or so on the 10 year. And you just heard in the last hour about crude uh, uh, saying still at 23, 24 dollars a barrel. The demand side is still a massive question. So you really could see some further downside risk here. And that is certainly coming and being priced out in the market. If there's any positive news, it could be a little bit of dollar weakness. As you know, we had massive dollar strength in the last few weeks, given the funding issues and everyone just wanted hands on dollars. So the fact that that's easing a little bit could give us some hope that maybe some of the funding issues have worked themselves out. What is not working themselves out is big tech. We came into this year, David, I was in San Francisco. You had uh, uh, Mark Mahaney over at RBC saying Google, Facebook, top calls for the year on the ad spending. They all thought that given it was an election year, it was the Olympics, yeah. it was all going to be a huge advertising year. As we know, the Olympics were delayed. Facebook coming out and saying they're seeing a big uptick in usage of WhatsApp. The demand for news is there, right. and yet it's not translating into ad sales. As you know, when you're running a big corporation, the first thing you cut when things are tough is that discretionary spending. So firms yeah. are starting to pull back on some of that advertising revenue. That's why you're getting an uptick in usage, but it's not translating into sales. I would be shocked if we didn't get a lot of these analysts coming out on the street and revising now after the Olympics are delayed what that means now for some of this ad revenue. Exactly. But we can hope for the best. So, okay, thanks so much for Taylor Riggs for that report on the markets. The coronavirus crisis has brought a whole new meaning and importance to working from home. And Cisco provides much of the backbone for the systems so many of us now are using to get that work done from remote locations. Welcome now Chuck Robbins. He is chairman and CEO of Cisco Systems, and he comes to us from San Jose. So, Chuck, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Let's start with that issue, because Cisco is so integral through your WebEx program and things like that. It's so integral to working from home. What kind of traffic are you seeing? How are you holding up? Well, I tell you, first of all, David, thanks for having me on, and thanks for all that you guys are doing to, uh, to, to report on this situation. Uh, look, we, we've seen unprecedented volumes. We are, to your point, uh, critical infrastructure for working from home and and the internet service providers that are servicing all of uh, all of us who are trying to work from home. I'll give you some statistics. Uh, we launched both free cloud security offers and free WebEx offers. And um, in the first 24 hours of putting that offer out, we had 240,000 new users sign up. And this is a platform that, you know, before this crisis was running 300 million users per month. Uh, we are now at, uh, we're doing four and a half million meetings a day. That's, that doesn't even include one-on-ones that are occurring on the platform. Uh, we're at 12 billion meeting minutes through March so far. And just to put it in perspective, in the United States during any one hour period, we will do 100 million meeting minutes in just one hour in the United States right now. So we've seen incredible demand. I'll tell you, our teams are tired, <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, when you're when you're talking about a platform that is now trying to support three to four to five times the volume that it ever uh, was built for four weeks ago, uh, they've done yeoman's work, frankly, to be where we are. So, Chuck, have you been able to identify any weaknesses in the system? Because you, no one was prepared for this sort of onslaught, none of us, anywhere, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, have you noticed any weaknesses or any things that you can be improving? What are those weaknesses? What are you doing? Well, prim primarily, David, it's just about capacity. And, uh, you know, we have tremendous relationships with the large service providers around the world, and they've been incredible partners for us. Uh, we had a, a, one of the major ones in the U.S. We needed capacity this week. I sent him a text at 6 o'clock at night, and by midnight they had done the work and increased the capacity. So it's just related to that, and there, there are minor things that will happen during the day. You know, we need everybody to be patient as we're just seeing these volumes that these platforms weren't built for. I mean, I, I've joked with our team. I should have told you when we spec this, these technologies that you need to build them to have everyone in the world working from home. 
And uh, clearly we didn't do that. But the team, I, I have to tell you, I am so proud of what our team has accomplished because they're working seven by 24. We're trying to put more resources with them because I'm worried about them right now, actually. Uh, what's your own experience with working from home as a practical matter? Is that giving you a different perspective on actually the product you produce? Well, it's, it's um, first of all, I think we all like working from home periodically. I think we all miss the office tremendously. But, uh, you know, for our employees, we, we've, we've looked at this across three vectors, right? What are we doing for our employees? What are we doing for our customers? And what are we doing for our communities? And even from home, we're able to execute on all of that. So, you know, we have all of our employees are working from home. We've, we've stated that we'll continue to pay our contract and hourly workers. We're doing a video meeting with all our employees every week right now, the entire company. And uh, we're, we have medical experts that are on. We have one later tonight where we'll do uh, a Q&A. And we have 20,000, 30,000 employees joining uh, these Q&A sessions just so we can keep everybody up to date on what's happening in the world. And uh, it's, it's working fine for us right now. I think everybody's anxious to get back, but I think right now it's, it's working great. So as you say, you've got your hands full right now just getting day to day. But is it too soon to start thinking about longer term uh, implications for your business, for the business overall? I wonder if everybody who has learned to work from home will necessarily go back to the office once we're past this. Well, I think that the, the capacity and the ability to work from home will continue. And I think what this is helping people understand is that it's possible and you can be productive from home. So I think that I do think that this will change how we think about it in the future, uh, but it's too early for us to really understand. And I told our, our leadership team, we had a leadership all hands yesterday, and I told them, look, we're, we're not going to understand any structural changes to our business until we get to the other side of this. So I'll tell you, David, the big thing that we're really worried about uh, beyond our customers, beyond our employees, are our communities. And you know, we, I, it's great to see the package being passed in Washington today, but we've been trying to spearhead. You think about what's happening with our homeless communities, with those who are, you know, one financial crisis away from, from being on the streets. I mean, these are the people we have to focus on right now. And we've been working very hard in Silicon Valley with our our public counterparts to actually try to make sure we're taking care of them as well. Well, I know that Cisco has stepped up and made a substantial contribution to try to help the effort. Let's talk about your employees. You've mentioned them a couple of times. At the same time that we need you more than ever, you also have to worry about the health and safety of your own employees. How do you strike that balance, Chuck? Well, we err on the side of safety for our employees. We were really early on work from home, and we we were making those decisions around the globe as we saw this virus spread. And then candidly, we were very quick to just say, we're, we're, everyone's working from home. Now we're blessed that we have technology. Everyone has this technology. And, um, and then we've also been, we, but, but our employees have been in the middle of this crisis response. We had employees in the hospitals that were being built in China, helping stand up networking equipment, delivering video units. We've been doing it in countries all around the world. We're working on trying to network enable these parking lot labs that are being put up right now. So our teams, many are working from home, but there's a there's a small percentage of our employees who are who are working in the middle of this crisis right now, trying to help uh, get us to the other side. So we continue to do everything we can to take care of them as well. But we also have to make sure we're doing our part. Uh, Chuck, do you have a sense of what this means to Cisco as a business, just in terms of dollars and cents? revenue, costs, things like that. The demand is way up, as you've described, dramatically up. At the same time, are you concerned about the ability of some of your customers to pay? Well, you know, to be honest with you, David, we're not worried about it right now. We're, we're actually just trying to get through this crisis. And so whatever our customers need, we're prioritizing our supply chain capacity. You know, we historically, we would prioritize that by our biggest customers who you know, who were, who were the loudest. And frankly, now we've put a whole process in place to prioritize our supply chain capacity for those companies who are in the middle of trying to solve this crisis. So uh, we're not thinking much about what happens longer term. We're just trying to make sure we're doing our part to get through it right now. And uh, we'll continue to do that. And then we'll figure it out later. Chuck, you mentioned that $2 trillion uh, stimulus package or spending package that apparently has been ag agreed to now in Washington. We hope it'll get signed soon by the president. What do you want to see from the government at this point? Speed. I think we need to see we need to see speed. I, I think about this crisis from 
in three ways, right? There's, there's the medical response, which we need to continue to support those heroes who are out there. I mean, they are, these people are doing unbelievable work. There's the financial response, which we now have, and we need to get that money into the hands of the people who need it. And then the third is making sure that our customers and all of the companies around the world can remain as productive as possible as we go through this this different way of working. And, uh, you know, we just need, we need speed. And I think that to the extent these small businesses can have a, a degree of confidence and these individuals can have a degree of confidence, then it will take a lot of stress out of the system. One of, one of the things that is reportedly being considered in Washington right now is lifting the tariffs, rolling back the tariffs. Where are you on that? Well, we would certainly be supportive. I haven't heard that. Um, we're, we're, we're basically not worried about the tariffs. We're, wherever we need to get our equipment from to meet the needs of our customers, we're just getting it. And, uh, you know, I think most companies right now, uh, you know, have just basically said, look, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to get through this crisis. We are doing things. We're not worried about the short-term impact on the business. We need to do what we need to do. So the tariffs are somewhat irrelevant right now to us. Okay, Chuck, thank you so very much for your time today. That is Cisco Chairman and CEO Chuck Robbins. And we turn now to Ritika Gupta for Bloomberg First Word News. Thanks, David. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell says the Senate will vote today on that historic stimulus package. It provides almost $2 trillion to rescue the U.S. economy from the impact of the coronavirus outbreak. Most Americans will get direct payments, industries will get bailout money, and small businesses will get aid to help keep workers on the payroll. The House also will have to pass the measure before it can go to President Trump. In Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel's government has unlocked a historic rescue package. A majority of lawmakers in the Bundestag voted to allow additional borrowing to combat the coronavirus crisis. The new borrowing of $169 billion will be used to protect German jobs and businesses. In Tokyo, officials are asking residents to stay indoors amid a jump in coronavirus cases. And they're warning the city could face a lockdown if the situation doesn't improve. Tokyo has been able to keep its numbers low, but has seen an uptick in cases during the past three days. There are 212 cases in Tokyo, among a population of almost 14 million. In Russia, Vladimir Putin has pushed off a public vote on constitutional changes that would let him stay in power till 2036. The vote was set for April 22nd. Putin says it will now be held at a date to be determined later. Russia is trying to stem the spread of coronavirus. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Ritika. Coming up, we're going to talk with former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz about how to manage a global crisis. This is Bloomberg. Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Ernest Moniz is a nuclear physicist who became Secretary of Energy under President Obama and now heads both the Nuclear Threat Initiative and the Energy Futures Initiative. He comes to us today from Boston. So welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are morning, looking David. at this crisis. You are in charge of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, as I said, but part of your, one of your colleagues there actually had a report out last fall warning that we were not prepared for a pandemic. It's too late to say what we should have done, but based on that research, what should we be doing now? Uh, well, first of all, let me say that the report you referred to, David, was a joint effort uh, with the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The overarching conclusion uh, was that the world uh, was not really prepared for a pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are seeing some of that play out. Uh, but uh, certainly we're taking lessons from the international response. Uh, for example, countries like uh, South Korea and, and Singapore uh, that showed great speed uh, in reacting to the uh, to the virus uh, have certainly done uh, relatively well uh, in its in its containment. But as you say, uh, we are where we are uh, now today, and uh, and today in the United States, uh, the really the major issue right now, I would argue, is uh, both the uh, supply of the uh, personal uh, protective equipment, uh, masks and, 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 and ventilators uh, and the like, 
uh, getting that supply to scale very, very dramatically, frankly, much more than we're seeing today, uh, is, number one, very, very critical. And secondly, uh, both for uh, controlling the health impacts, uh, but also for facilitating uh, the pathway back to uh, economic recovery, we just need millions and millions and millions of tests uh, with fast turnaround times uh, so that we can manage uh, that return to the economy. Uh, and again, uh, it's good to see that we are ramping up, but frankly, uh, I think we need uh, a dramatic increase in the logistical coordination uh, than we are seeing currently in our national response. So, Mr. Secretary, from your experience in the government and elsewhere, uh, what could we do that we're not doing? Because uh, you said both on the, pro the personal protective equipment and also on the test, we're not where we need to be. Uh, should we be taking seriously the notion that this is a war of sorts and do what they did in World War II, I believe, which said, we just need this many bombers, we need this much ammunition, and work backwards and say, we'll do whatever we can to get there, rather than sort of a bottom-up, let's make sure how many of the masks, for example, can produ produ be produced by various companies? I, I think that's absolutely correct, uh, that, and that's why I use the word logistics. Uh, of course, in the, those kinds of uh, major mobilizations, uh, managing logistics is an enormous uh, part of the, of the issue. Uh, I think we have the talent in this country, both in the, uh, well, in the military, but of course also in the private sector, to manage uh, large-scale logistics. We need to do that, and we need to do that by first identifying uh, where, where is the equipment we need, first of all, today, and I think a big part of that answer is China. Uh, and we should be talking about how uh, to coordinate uh, with our states, with our governors, uh, how we can have a massive supply uh, from China um, uh, today, but also then preparing our own industry, uh, whether it's the Defense Production Act or not, uh, our own industry uh, to start manufacturing uh, at a very, very large scale, because this is not going away tomorrow. Uh, and so that's something we need for ourselves and we need for the world, because uh, China and the United States, for example, will certainly be uh, two of the hot spots for manufacturing, we would hope, of all of, the, all of the necessary equipment. So I think this is what we really need to do, and, and what you're saying in terms of uh, mobilization uh, is right, uh, right on mark. Still ahead, we're going to be hearing from Olaf Scholz. He is Germany's finance minister. Germany's lower house of parliament just voted to allow unlimited debt, 750 billion euro, euros as I understand it. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a check on the markets. They have been whipsawing all day long, and now, right at the moment, they're a little bit higher. So here is Kaylee Lines. What is going on in the markets, Kaylee? We're a little bit higher. I mean, the S&P 500 is higher by just about five tenths of one percent. Uh -huh. It's really just been going all over the place. Equity markets really struggling to find a footing here. Obviously, we had a really strong day yesterday. The Dow, best day since the Great Depression era, and it is able to add on to its gains this morning. But again, the Nasdaq is actually slightly in the red. I think on the one hand, you do have have stimulus coming. Mm -hmm. $2 trillion is about to be thrown at the U.S. economy. But then on the other hand, you still have the ongoing epidemic with more cases or pandemic, I should say, more cases piling up each and every day. And I think the market is kind of trying to counterbalance those two. I will say that the specific companies that are going to aid in the stimulus think airlines, yeah. Boeing reportedly targeted in this bill, according to the Washington Post, those are the stocks that are leading the equity market today. You have Boeing up by more than a quarter, Norwegian Cruise Lines up by 21%, Royal Caribbean up by 16 Those stocks are getting a, uh, a lift here because they are being targeted. I think the question the market is contending with is, yes, you're getting the specific relief, but is this going to lead to a broader economic recovery? That remains an open question. And what's going on in the bond market? Well, that's interesting because we do have small gains for equities today, mm -hmm. but you're still seeing that bid into the bond market. The U.S. 10-year yield is down by about six basis points today. Now, this isn't the first day we've seen this happen, that stocks and bonds move in the same direction. We've actually kind of been seeing a lot of it lately, but the fact that you do still have money flowing into fixed income indicates that things are more risk-off than they are risk-on at this yeah, it's point. It's fascinating because clearly there's going to be a lot more issuance. you think that that right. would actually drive down the price of bonds, if anything. 
Well, I mean, it's happened earlier yesterday. We saw Mnuchin say we're going to issue longer dated debt to pay for all the stimulus and you immediately saw yields pop back up. But then you have to counterbalance with still liquidity issues that are getting figured out, still kind of a, a, a desire for safety on the park market participants and that's kind of what you're seeing play out in the bond market at this point. If you watch the market tick by tick as it were, is it responding more to the coronavirus news than it is to what's going on in Washington or is it just whipsawed between the two? It whips us between the two. I will say that when we saw futures and European stocks really roll over this morning is when we saw that there was an uptake in cases in Spain and the worst day ever in Italy. I think those are just constant reminders to this market that whether or not we're getting action for monetary policy, whether or not we're getting trillions in fiscal stimulus, the virus is still out there. It is still spreading across the world. And it's just those constant reminders, I think, remind equity investors that we still really don't know what's going to happen and we don't know what is going to be enough to fix it. Do you have a sense of volume? I can get trading. you a sense of volume <laughs> I'm just right curious now. curious about where the volume is. Um, I mean, well, Friday was that quadruple witch witching day. Right. And, and the volume has been up in general. It has. I mean, we've been seeing more trades right now. Actually, over the past 30 days, volume is about 36% above the average. Granted, oh. the past 30 days haven't been your average 30 days, and that yeah. really for the past several weeks, we've been seeing these wild swings in the market. But you are still seeing a lot of volume. Interestingly, when we saw the highest volume, when I'm looking at this chart on my terminal, was right at the open when we actually went lower. Volume is kind of leveled off as we've moved throughout the day and just kind of fluctuated between these gains and losses. Okay, thank you so much, Kayla Lynch, for that report on the markets. Coming up with the Trump administration and the Senate reaching a deal on an historic rescue package, we'll dig into the details. That's going to be coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. From New York, this is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. The record U.S. economic stimulus package will provide much needed aid to small companies and Americans hit hard by the coronavirus. But as always, there could be some people who are left out. Let's bring in now Bloomberg's Katya Dmitrieva for more. So Katya, you have a piece actually in the Bloomberg saying this is not going to be enough. Surprisingly enough, two trillion dollars seems astronomical. Yeah, two trillion, which by the way is about 10 percent of total output in 2019. So. It's a, it's a pretty big package, but the problem is is always the details and the caveats. So, for example, uh, one of the things is individuals will get those twelve hundred dollar uh, checks in the mail, and those are supposed to go out by April sixth. That's what we heard from Chuck Schumer, who heard it from Donald Trump, President Donald Trump. The question is, will that actually happen? Uh, we know in the last recession, it took up to two months for those to go out. The same thing with small business loans. There's a portion that goes out to small business loans, about $350 billion, but how quickly will those go out? Um, and also how accessible is it? We've been talking to some small companies that don't even know how to navigate the system. The SBA is also uh, limited by how many employees they have, right? So there are all these technical issues that remain to be seen um, how they'll get worked out. So, Katya, to sort of put you on the spot, is this a matter of making sure it gets to the right places and we're not sure that this bill will get that done, or is it a matter of the overall size? Because 10 percent of the total output is a lot. On the other hand, that's what is that, a little more than a month's worth of shutting down the economy? It looks like it may be longer than that. Yeah, it really depends on who you ask. We've been talking to a lot of economists in recent days who say um, that it actually needs to be a case of the government stepping in and taking care of all the lost demand. So, you know, you heard from St. Louis Fed President Bullard, who said that it should actually be like a three month holiday um, that would not even have a price tag on it. We don't know how much that would be. It would be in the tens of trillions of dollars, if not more, when you think about it um, as a sort of Band-Aid measure and as something that um, gets people by this works. But um, everyone we've spoken to so far is saying that they need to start policymakers need to start thinking about fiscal stimulus part four. Uh, mm -hmm. So this could be potentially the same size bill or or even bigger. And again, it's not even the size. It's really about the details, how quickly they could get it out, who it applies to. Um, so we're just going to be waiting for those details to come out. Okay, Katya, thank you so very much. That's our very own Katya Dmitrieva reporting on the stimulus bill. And now we're being joined over the telephone by Republican Congressman Trey Hollingsworth of Indiana. He's a member of the House Financial Services Committee, and he himself is a small business owner, so he knows about small business. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. Respond to what we just heard. Do you think that the $2 trillion will be enough, or are you already thinking about maybe a stimulus four? 
Well, look, I think we want to ensure that we are doing everything we can to help our small businesses, to help our employees, and to help everyone through this very difficult and stressful time. And certainly this is a step in the right direction. I certainly believe with Ka- with Katya as well that we need to make sure that the devil's in the details here, that we get this money out as quickly as possible to those that need it as soon as possible, because ultimately time matters here. This is a liquidity crisis for businesses that have seen all of their revenues dry up for the last two weeks, but still have fixed obligations. So getting it to them as quickly as possible is key, just as Katya said. How is it going out in Indiana? As I say, you're a founder and you ran a small business out there. How are your fellow small business owners? It's a challenging environment. I tell you what, it is a deeply, deeply concerning environment. I think that they are hit not only with the loss of revenues for the last couple of weeks, but also the prospect of an unknown period of time for which they're going to lose revenues going forward. Everyone's scrambling to meet their fixed obligations. Everyone's scrambling to keep as many employees as they can. But I will tell you, Hoosier hospitality, Hoosier resilience remains very strong. Everyone understands that this is necessary. Everyone understands that what we are doing is going to slow down the rise to the peak, just as we've heard Fauci talk about over and over again. And so everyone remains resolved to do the right thing for themselves, for their businesses, for their employees, for the economy, and for those that are in our hospitals right now. Slowing down that peak is critical. Everyone seems to agree with that because it can really overtax our hospitals the way we've seen in Italy. At the same time, President Trump now is saying he'd really like to get business coming back by Easter time. Do you think he may be rushing it a bit? I think it remains to be seen, right? We have a lot of factors in play uh, as to how social distancing is affecting the basic transmission rate of the disease. In addition to that, we've seen some new and promising trials begin for therapies or for vaccines. We've also seen some new diagnostic tests that have come out that could speed uh, diagnosis even faster. All of those things play a part in this. All of those things play a part. And we want to make sure we do exactly the right thing for the American public and not going too early, but also because of the economy, not going too late. So I think it's going to be a balancing act. I think it's an evolving situation day by day and something that lawmakers, the president, healthcare workers have to keep in mind every single day. Uh, how confident are you that the government is doing what it can? I'm talking about the federal government now, right now, to really marshal all the resources to get things like personal protective equipment for the health care workers to make sure we have enough test kits. Are we doing everything we can? We are. I think that even more importantly, what we're seeing is the private sector begin to leverage their resources to do even more. We've seen some great American manufacturers step up and say that they can make ventilators. We've seen some great American manufacturers step up and say we can make N95 masks. So I think what we are seeing is the fusion of the private and public sectors to empower American healthcare workers, to empower American biotech to be able to slow this curve down, to flatten it out, and to save as many individuals as possible possible. And I think that that is something I am truly proud of. When I continue to read stories over and over again about companies that are leveraging all their resources, developing new techniques, developing new therapies, developing new vaccines, I continue to be proud to be an American and the Americans that are standing up for our frontline workers that are risking their lives day in and day out. Congressman, how do you get information about the coronavirus? You as a legislator, as a lawmaker, uh, where do you turn to for for your information and how uh, accurate do you find it to be? How reliable? Well, first and foremost, I am calling all the way across the district every single day. I'm talking to my fellow Hoosiers in my communities across the district, small business owners, those first responders, and asking, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And then we're taking action because of that. When we hear about a particular challenge, whether that's PPE or food supplies or concerns about access to tests or concerns about small business having access to the loans that we're making available through legislation, we jump on that immediately because, as Katya said before, this is a race against time. We have to make sure that we get the resources, the tools in everyone's hands as quickly as possible. So first and foremost, it is information that comes from district that is most valuable because it's what they're seeing on the ground. These are the frontline individuals, whether they're employers, employees, healthcare workers, first responders. These are the individuals that are seeing it firsthand. How worried about are you about uh, running short of the critical medical supplies out in Indiana? I believe that we will find a way to continue to manufacture this. As you know, Indiana's state GDP has the highest proportion derived from manufacturing. We have a lot of great manufacturers all the way across the district, all the way across the state, many of whom have stepped up and said, we can make that, we will make that, and we will dramatically increase production. So I continue to believe that though this peak is coming, 
though we are riding through the acceleration phase right now, that we will find a way to manufacture the PPE that is required for our hospitals, for our frontline workers to remain safe and to remain giving the care that they need to do. If you could have us all do one thing we're not doing right now, I mean, the government, the rest of us, what would it be? Well, I think we've got to continue to abide by these restrictions. I continue to see and hear stories about people that are going out even though they've got symptoms, that are re going into larger crowds, that are continuing to go out and have conversations with other individuals. We need to abide by these restrictions to lower that basic transmission rate so that we can get back to our normal life as soon as possible. We need to buy our healthcare workers time. We need to buy our drug makers time. We need to buy a great American innovators time. And the only way that we're going to do that is to abide by these restrictions in the short run so that we can all be better off in the long run. Congressman, we've talked about the fiscal stimulus that come from this $2 trillion bill. What about the monetary side? Are you comfortable with what the Fed is doing? Because it's going a very long way. And as I understand, even in this $2 trillion bill, it allows the Treasury to loan some money to the Fed to, that they could really leverage up and make a lot more loans. I do. I believe that the Fed has taken very swift action. They learned a lot in the last crisis about taking action early and taking serious and significant action from the very beginning. And I think they have done that. They have worked very hard to ensure that the plumbing of the financial system continues to operate. And I think you've seen markets begin to stabilize. I think you've seen markets begin to get the grasp that the Fed is going to do what it takes to ensure that these markets continue to function, irrespective of what level they're at, that they're going to continue to function. And I think that has been hugely important over the weekend, over the past week, that the Fed has stepped up and said, whatever it takes to ensure that markets continue to operate, we will do. And I think that that was a first huge step and a significant lesson coming out of the last crisis where we were too late to act. Congressman, that's the markets working. What about the Congress working? Are, are you confident that we're equipped now to have the Congress function no matter what happens? We already have some cases of coronavirus in the Congress, House and Senate side both. Right. We will find a way to continue to function. We will ensure that Congress continues to operate and that the federal government leverages every single resource at its disposal to keep Americans safe and to keep the American way of life safe. I absolutely believe that America will find a way period. America will find a way to treat this disease. America will find a way to beat this disease. I believe that Congress can play a role in that, but every American can also play a huge role in ensuring that we're doing everything we can to slow down that basic transmission rate such that we get to a longer peak rather than a shorter, higher peak, such that we can protect our health care workers. Okay, Congressman, really appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. That's Congressman Trey Hollingsworth of Indiana. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is hoping to push that nearly $2 trillion stimulus plan through the Senate today. The House would still need to approve it before President Trump can sign it into law. The measure provides support for individuals and businesses, but not all Americans who need the direct payments will get them, and timing remains an issue. Further aid may be needed to help a wider range of people and companies. Mortgage applications in the U.S. plunged last week by the most since the financial crisis. The Mortgage Bankers Association index fell more than 29 percent. Coronavirus shutdowns and related financial turmoil pushed borrowing costs higher. Euro area finance ministers took a small step toward a rescue package today. They were able to put some detail on a proposal to activate the bloc's bailout fund. Still, they haven't been able to settle the differences that are holding up the money. In the UK, Prince Charles has tested positive for coronavirus. That's according to the Press Association, which cites the Royal Palace. The prince is 71 years old. The report says he has been displaying mild symptoms, but is otherwise in good health. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Ritika. Coming up here, the U.S. is not the only country working to pass an unprecedented stimulus package. Germany is closing in on a 750 billion euro plan. We get the details from the country's finance minister next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Let's get another view on the coronavirus crisis now. Yesterday, I got to talk to the chairman and CEO of 3M, Mike Roman. 3M, of course, is the manufacturer of those critical N95 masks being used for the personal protective equipment by healthcare workers around the country. We talked about exactly what they're doing at 3M, but also how they're working with the government. This is what he said. Well, we've been working very closely with the government. We've been working you know, with, uh, with Vice President Pence from his visit, looking at how to make sure that we can shift what have been the industrial N95 respirators into healthcare. So it was really appreciate the, the emergency use authorization out of the FDA and then the PrEP Act amendment, which enabled us to be able to deliver our industrial respirators, that N95, to the healthcare workers at the front line. That was the first big step. And so we worked together on that. Uh, the Defense Production Act really has enabled us to work together on making sure we are getting the respirators to the most critical needs around the country. And our, our teams are working together with FEMA, with Health and Human Services, making sure that we are delivering where the needs are greatest. So it, it's a partnership that, that really uh, has been very effective as we've come through the month of March. Moving beyond the N95, there's something that I'm learning about called the Powered Air Purifying Respirator, which is the PAPR. There was an announcement that 3M made together with GE and with Ford and the UAW today. Explain to us what those devices are and what the nature of this joint venture is. Yeah, this is, I, I think it's a great example of how companies have stepped up. They've, they've responded to the call to action to do everything they can to help serve the public safety and the needs of the healthcare workers. This is a great example Ford reached out to us uh, to work together on anything that we could do to increase our capacity and, and the solutions we can bring to the market. And this powered air purifier is an area that it's, a, it's an important product for use in, in some of the healthcare uh, environments. And, and Ford can bring expertise. Uh, they can bring skills where it's needed most for us and help us uh, increase our production of, <clears throat> of those powered air purifiers. So it's a it was really, I'm, I'm really pleased with uh, Ford's response and the help they've been giving us. Uh, are there other possible joint ventures like that you may be working on or at least taking a look at that might expand our p capacity for giving protection equipment to healthcare workers? Well, we're, we're looking at all across the supply chain. What can we do to increase our capacity? So we're working with a number of companies. How can we increase the output of our lines? How can we bring new production faster? That's one of the things that we can do is get what would be a normal, a longer lead time to bring on new capacity? How do we shorten that? Companies are stepping into that. There's also the logistics side. Normally, the supply chain is very efficient, but in times like this, where we are we are changing daily our our working environments, we we are finding people that are stepping up to help us expedite our products. We now have the ability to ship directly from our plants to areas that we need. Uh, really expedite overnight orders that, that are critical to uh, needs on the front line. So it's been across that whole you know, supply chain spectrum, and, and maybe most important in expanding capacity, but help all the way back to raw materials has been, uh, been very, very important the way companies have stepped up. Uh, that was part of my interview with Mike Roman. He's the 3M chairman and CEO. Coming up here, we're going to go over to Europe's economic engine. We're going to uh, we go live in Germany and Berlin with the country's finance minister discussing that big stimulus package coming down the pike. This is Bloomberg. Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. German Parliament voted earlier today to approve an historic 750 billion euro spending plan to counter the effects of the coronavirus. Bloomberg European Open anchor Matt Miller is in Berlin with one of the key architects of that stimulus package. Matt? David, thanks very much. I'm here with Olaf Scholz, the finance minister of Germany. And you were one of uh, the key architects of this a big package, 750 billion euros uh, in, in, in aid and in stimulus that's just passed through the Bundestag right behind us. Walk us through how, how this is going to work. Um, how much of it is actual stimulus? How much of it is for liquidity? How much of it goes to people on the streets? How much for companies? So the first is that there is a, a credit line for the federal budget, which is 156 billion. And this will be enough, for instance, to finance all the net needs we have to give support to small companies, for instance, who 
have uh, closed their shop because they can't, can't open it anymore, but will have to pay the rent. We have, uh, for instance, extra money which we give to our social insurance system to make it feasible to support those who are now in, um, in the situation that they don't have any work. We have uh, a special scheme which helps us to give uh, money to the companies that they could uh, be together with their employees without putting them out of the job. And we pay for the, for the, for the, for the wages. And uh, we have uh, a lot of money which we will use with our social system that is already existing, giving people access to income which they need if they for instance are self-employed and don't have any income and income anymore so we can open it to them and this will be also extra money we have some reserves which are in this uh, package and aside of this there is a lot of uh, decisions to make it feasible for us to support the economy with instruments we already have there is our promotional bank with the KFW which we already gave the op op opportunity that they could uh, give uh, loans to all the business together with the usual banks but so there is no risk for the banks and they can give the liquidity to the companies and we which was uh, a 500 billion euro i mean these are big packages big numbers if you put them all together it totals well over a trillion euros what you've done today and what you did with the kfw last week but, but in the end this is just but really the chance that we make it feasible that the banking sector is still doing its service to the economy. And this is with the background of our KFW, the promotional bank. And uh, the same is with uh, the other decision. We used a fund which we had during the last crisis, 2008 and 9, the Financial Market Stability Fund, which was uh, drawn to give uh, the chance to finance uh, stocks or other ways of giving money for the com companies of the financial sector at that time. And we now changed it and moved it to the real economy. And so this fund will again have the possibility to give um, money to companies and for and instance, to buy stocks and give them the strength to stem the crisis. Yeah, let, let me ask about the actual cash though, right? Because it's, I think, only 156 billion that you're actually borrowing, and new money, fresh stimulus, the street is calling it. Is that enough? This will be enough for the next months because we just will have to make it feasible that the economy survives. And you should always understand that there is a very successful system of social welfare state, which is working as an automatic stabilizer the robust social welfare system of Germany is, I think, the, one of the most effective systems in the world to deal with a crisis without and making feasible that the people don't lose their incomes and give them confidence in a very difficult situation. So the question of stimulus is coming when we are through this situation. Then I think it's absolutely necessary that we not just wait for the economy to run again. Mm. So on the other side of this crisis, you mean after you've got the spread of the coronavirus in check, um, then Germany is going to have to think about you're already working on another stimulus package. This is something we could do then, and we are thinking about the possibilities, the needs, and what would be very effective. I think it's, uh, there is some, uh, there is some uh, sense in what uh, the economists tell us, saying it must be timely and targeted and it must be temporary. So instruments like this that help the economy to start again. And uh, on the what other hand... Of, what kind of size are you thinking? Because Germany has a love for the 50 billion number. We saw that the EU MTS auction was 50 billion, the 2008 crisis package was 50 billion, the last environmental package was about 50 billion. Are we talking about more than that now? Can we break out of that number? We will do the necessary things and we are able to do the necessary things. And this uh, will very much depend on the situation which we'll, we'll have after the situation ceased, we are now in, we are in now. And uh, I think the more important question is that we get through this situation to, uh, to be able to do things like that. Because in the situation right now, it would be a bit ridiculous to do some activity uh, so that tourism is booming 
at the of same course. time when we stop tourism. So it is not, it is not the right way to the right thing to of do. Of course, but you bring up an interesting point. Germany has given itself the ability to do this kind of stimulus. You brought your debt down to 60% of GDP. A lot of countries have had difficulty with that. How much firepower does that give you? How much room, how much space do you think you have now? I think we have all the firepower we need and we will use it. This is the message we give to anyone. And uh, it was always the idea behind our uh, fiscal strategies. When I discussed on the question about the question why, why it might make sense to reduce the public debt, it was also, it was always my, my argument saying, it is because there might be a crisis and then we need the strength to do the necessary things. Now we are in a crisis we haven't expected because it's uh, something that uh, came to mankind uh, all of a sudden in a way. But now we, now we have the strength and we will use it. So how high could you go? Would you be willing to, if necessary, go to 90% of GDP or 100% of GDP? It makes no sense to speculate about numbers like this. It's just necessary to know that we will not be enforced to do some, not to do something which we understand as sensible, because all the things that are necessary that will work will be done. You mentioned uh, it doesn't make any sense to try and boost the tourism industry right now. That's certainly true. Uh, companies like Lufthansa have seen their debt ratings cut to junk. They're, for all intents and purposes, not really operating anymore. How do you make sure that credit continues to flow to companies like that, that they don't fire workers, that they don't need to reduce capacity during this crisis? So first we give them, as anyone, any other company, the chance to save liquidity with this short-term allowance. We discussed about this, which gives them the possibility to uh, employ the people, though there is no work, because we give them the money for doing so. So, so, so when they get that money, do they have to also agree not to lay off workers? <coughs> they, they will stay to the workers at that time. And um, on the other hand, we have uh, the instruments for liquidity we discussed about, and we have also the instrument to give uh, uh, money to the company, which is uh, more in the, in the way of stocks. And there are different and several instruments just to make it feasible for them to get through the crisis to, so that they can start after the crisis again. And our aim is not um, to, to, make, to, to continue with, uh, for instance, government stocks or so. It is just that we say we are able to help you with all the different means, but afterwards we will put all the money out again and it will be private. So, so you don't expect to be actually taking stakes in these companies when you rescue or when you bail them out i hate to use that term because it's pejorative but when you save them um, you don't then take a stake in the company as part of that deal so we we might might buy stocks or so but uh, it is not for all the time it's just see, for so the situation of the yeah. crisis uh, speaking of buying stocks when i look at the the drop in, in value of a lot of these companies that we cover on a daily basis. They've lost a third, some of them a half of their value. Are you worried that other uh, investors in other countries, for example, China has recovered relatively quickly and Germany's just at the start of this, are going to be able to come in here and acquire German assets at a discounted value? We would be able to, to react to that with legal measures, but also with uh, a lot of uh, fiscal money we could use. But will you be considering nationalizing some German companies in order to save them from foreign takeovers? I think this will be not really necessary because we will have ways to avoid a, situa like ways to, ways to avoid a situation like this. Um, the, uh, the money that's earmarked for bailouts um, now, how do you expect that to, uh, how, how much do you expect to spend? How much do you expect you're gonna need in order to save companies um, it is, throughout the crisis. It is quite difficult to, uh, to, to give numbers in this question. It's only important that we have the ability to do anything that is necessary and that we are willing to do it. In, in terms of 
the companies that you've looked at helping or that you talked about helping and the people that you've talked about uh, helping, I don't see any banks in there. You're, looked, you're focused mostly on the industrial engine here and the, and the consumers, the voters, the people. What about banks? Are they going to need any help? It doesn't look like this because uh, if we uh, make it feasible for them to continue with their business and giving liquidity to the, to, to the economy uh, with the background of uh, our money of the pr promotional bank, I think it will be enough for them. And if we stabilize the companies of the, of the economy, it will also stabilize the banks. So it is not directly, it's just uh, helping them to be successful with their clients. So you're not concerned about an economic crisis that snowballs into a financial crisis? It or you're taking action to stop that? It is not looking like this, and it makes no sense to speculate about it. Let me ask you about the, uh, the other countries in Europe. You're involved in um, meetings to try and shore up countries that haven't put themselves in as strong a fiscal position as Germany in the past, Italy, for example. Um, how important is it to you to show solidarity to help other countries that, that need Germany's help in Europe? It's absolutely key that we stick together in the European Union and also in the Eurozone. And uh, we are willing to do it. We are discussing about the ways how this could be successful. So some decisions already have been taken. Uh, the European Commission allowed any country to use fiscal activities to fight against the crisis, uh, the medical crisis, but also the crisis which is uh, linked to the economy following the uh, pandemic. And um, secondly, the Commission is looking at its own budget, whether there is some room for maneuver that they could use to uh, support countries that need help. We decided that uh, there should be uh, relatively free room for activities which are linked a little bit with state aid, just for the situation of the crisis, but not forever, but now when it's necessary. And um, I think it's also right, correct, that we discussed about uh, the activities that could be done, for instance, by the EIB, because this is something like a promotional bank on the European level, and it uh, could be absolutely useful, this, especially in those countries where the national banks of that sort are not working that effective or are not big enough or are not really existing, that this could be done by the EIB, which would be very useful. And uh, in the end, we have the instrument we developed after the last crisis with, for instance, the ESM. And so it's absolutely useful to look at this, uh, um, this possibilities to be prepared for situations which possibly might not uh, arise, but it is necessary that we know that we are much stronger than 10 years ago. So it looks like uh, the ESM will, there will be a precautionary credit line from the ESM up to 2% of uh, GDP. I want to give you a quote from Holger Schmieding at Berenberg Bank, who was talking about the Eurogroup decision. He says, the Eurogroup result shows that, once again, when it comes to actions of seriously impressive scale in the Eurozone, the ECB is the only institution that's really capable of that. Is he wrong, or is that by design? No, there is the ECB, yes, but there, is also, there are also other in institutions and instruments we have. <clears throat> and uh, as we already discussed, we are uh, we are looking at uh, them and discussing what could be a useful activity. So but I he's just saying you're not coming out with the bazooka. The Eurogroup isn't going to do whatever it takes. I think we have uh, the necessary instruments, and uh, there is a difference to other, to the United States, for instance. If you would understand whether the amount of money that is now used from fiscal uh, f perspectives to fight against the crisis, you have to count the activities of all the member states of the European Union or uh, of the Eurozone. You cannot just look at the 
at, at the European level, mm. because this is different to the United States. But if you count the things together, it will be not of a that different size. One thing we have in the United States, though, is a shared currency. We have a single central bank, solidarity between the states, and so we assume shared debt. Why isn't Germany willing to go forward and, and take that step towards more com a more complete union? Uh, nine other country leaders in, in Europe are pushing, including the French, for what are being called corona bonds or what typically are called euro bonds. Um, I think the more important question is uh, the, to understand what is the activities uh, of these European levels compared to the United States. For instance, if you look at uh, defense, you will not find anything as Europe. You will find the national armies, and you will understand that, for instance, the taxes are raised from the states to pay for defense. This is the same if you look, for instance, at the social welfare systems. The United States welfare system is mostly on the union level. Um, this is not the case in Europe. It's something that is working in different ways, but in all the member states. So if you want to understand the differences, you have to take into account that a lot of responsibilities and revenues are still on the national level, which are in the United States on the federal level. And uh, so it is necessary that we coordinate our policies, this is what we do, that we develop European instruments that could be used together and that we make a very precise and very effective use of them. And as I already said, uh, I think we will manage to be successful with this. And my view on the question is also that, um, that uh, if, you, if we do this effectively, we are as strong as if we would be one body. And this is the more important question if we look at the politics in this field. You could understand that Germany will work for solidarity in the European Union and uh, that we understand it's necessary that to, to fight together and this will happen.